Welcome to the University of Washington Cardiology Grand Round Series. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to all of you today, Jeff Keenan, uh, one of our new cardiac surgeons. Um, so I'll uh, tell you a little bit about Jeff, but uh, leave most of the time for him here. So he uh, did his undergraduate training at UNC Chapel Hill and his medical school training at the University of Maryland. Um, and then he went on to Duke to do uh, their combined general surgery and uh, cardiac surgery training program where he spent uh, the rest of his, uh, uh, the, the last decade really, um, uh, including two years on a, a F32 that he was awarded uh, doing basic uh, sort of translational research on sepsis path pathways um, uh, in, in the lab. And so, um, over the next several years, as he completed his cardiac surgery training, he developed a really strong interest in cardiac transplant and circulatory support. Um, and he comes to us uh, starting here, I guess, at the end of last summer, right, Jeff? Mm -hmm. um, uh, with a strong interest uh, to build that area and to work with us in cardiology. Um, so it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Jeff and uh, looking forward to hearing his presentation. Thanks, Jeff. Take it away. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Greg. Um, for the kind introductions and um, uh, thank you all for joining today. I'm uh, privileged to have the opportunity to speak uh, in this forum. Um, I'm gonna start by just saying I don't have any conflicts to disclose. Um, and I'm gonna cover a fair bit of ground. Um, those who are, uh, happen to join early may have heard um, me giving some general descriptions of some of the uh, past research I was involved with. Um, I'm certainly ha happy to talk more about that here, but um, in the early phase of my uh, faculty and academic career, I haven't really established a significant research program yet. And so I, I'm not really going to discuss uh, that today, I'm, but I do intend to cover a lot of ground on what I have been very focused on, and that's um, within the cl clinical realm of um, uh, surgical advanced heart failure. Um, and so through the course of this talk, I plan to um, introduce and describe uh, the different uh, strategies and pathways towards heart transplantation, as well as durable circulatory support, and also sort of shed light to the fact that that's becoming, uh, those pathways are becoming more varied. Um, I'm gonna describe the current landscape for um, heart transplantation uh, in the United States, and, uh, and importantly, um, uh, specifically go over how the impact of the recent donor allocation uh, policy change um, is affecting our practices and then highlight um, where our practice here, here at UWMC uh, fits in in this greater context and then lastly introduce um, possible future directions to extend uh, advanced heart failure uh, uh, therapy options more broadly to our patients uh, while maintaining acceptable safety profile. So um, given, this, given the, the audience today, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, sort of describing the problem of heart failure. Um, I, I, I imagine that everyone on the call appreciates how serious an issue this is, a leading uh, source of mortality and morbidity in our society, as well as economic burden uh, related to the cost of healthcare um, and uh, you know, lost productivity from disability. Um, <laughs> and I am also well aware that Many people on this call um, are intimately involved in the medical management of advanced heart failure patients or, or just any, any heart failure patient. Um, and I know that many patients will be skillfully managed uh, with medical therapy and other modalities um, such that I really am not involved in their care. Um, and so there's a whole, there's a whole uh, uh, segment of uh, heart failure patients that, um, that, uh, that I, never hear about because I know they're effectively managed medically. Um, but nevertheless, uh, certainly there's a group of patients that um, despite optimal medical management uh, will experience disease, pro disease progression uh, and decompensation and ultimately need more advanced therapies, um, which broadly can be categorized uh, with heart transplantation and circulatory support. Um, and that, that's where I come in uh, and my colleagues in cardiac surgery come in in the, in the team aspect of, this care, of the care of these patients. Um, I also like to highlight through the course of this presentation that there's um, you know, uh, another population of patients that's becoming increasingly relevant for what we do. And that's patients who present in a de novo fashion um, with advanced heart failure or cardiogenic shock, really haven't had medical management, but can't be brought 
um, to stability uh, uh, on medical management and sort of progress directly to needing advanced therapies. And so the way I conceptualize it and the way I certainly speak to our residents um, in sort of the framework of this whole field is that patients who are uh, requiring advanced therapies, I think the discussion really starts with heart transplantation. Uh, this still remains uh, the gold standard therapy uh, for, these, for these patients. Um, and this is just uh, a recent UNOS data published in 2020, uh, which describes how the conditional survival or the survival of heart transplant pa patients who, who don't die within the first month, and that, that tends to be about four to five percent of patients, the conditional survival thereafter, median survival is about 15 years, which is really remarkable. Uh, if you consider the fact that most uh, patients who undergo heart transplant in the absence of that therapy wouldn't be expected to live more than a year or two, um, and many of them much, much shorter time than that, um, the fact that they get a median survival of 15 years and, and usually a uh, very high quality of life as well is really a remarkable thing. Um, and it's one of the major reasons why I was um, uh, inspired to go into this field. Um, and so that's really where the conversation starts. And, and um, in our decision-making process, uh, this is just one, one schematic uh, that could be put forth, but uh, it really starts when we're thinking about advanced heart failure therapy for patients is uh, are they accepted for heart transplant listing? And um, if the answer is no, we certainly uh, look hard and see if there's potentially modifiable factors, um, such as those listed here that we can intervene upon, um, either with medical therapy um, or sometimes um, uh, with circulatory support therapies um, to ultimately allow them to, to, to come to transplant. Or alternatively, there are some patients we know will never be transplant candidates that uh, we'll go on to a durable form of mechanical circulatory support as a destination therapy. Uh, but for those patients that are accepted for transplant listing, there becomes a big question on how we then support and manage that patient until the opportunity comes for them to actually be transplanted. And so uh, the major crux of this talk is really going to focus on how uh, there is a shift um, uh, towards uh, supporting uh, pre-transplant recipients um, uh, through temporary mechanical support modalities, and that's having significant ramifications um, throughout our systems. And if, if you sort of, you know, one of the major changes that, or one of the major things that became apparent to me as I transitioned from a trainee focused on the operations and the post-operative management of, of these sorts of patients was that the process of actually bringing the patient to transplantation or a durable form of mechanical circulatory support is actually quite varied. And um, it's often not linear. Um, there's sometimes some back and forth, um, but there's many different uh, routes that can occur. And sort of the older traditional route might've been either, you know, refractory to medical therapy, right to heart transplant, perhaps supported linotropes in an intervening fashion. Um, in the early 2000s and uh, into last decade, um, uh, durable LVADs uh, as well as TAH um, became viable therapies um, uh, to support patients either in a destination mode or as a bridge to transplant. Uh, so we certainly saw a lot of patients bridging to transplant through durable mechanical circulatory support. But increasingly uh, there's um, you know, a role for temporary mechanical circulatory support um, in bridging to transplantation. Um, and so ultimately, there's a whole different host of pathways that can occur to ultimately bring uh, the patient to their final therapy. And, you know, I purposely, a lot of these arrows are bi-directional. Um, you know, it's not always a straightforward path and uh, there's some stops and some starts. And uh, the point is that there ends up being a lot of patient-specific and situation-specific um, uh, management decisions and strategies that, that go into that whole process. And I, th I think it's important to sort of understand uh, the landscape um, for transplant in, in contemporary practice. And so this is UNOS data. Um, and uh, the four lines show here, shown here include in the light purple, the number of heart transplantations over the last decade. In the gray, uh, waiting list deaths over the last decade. And then um, in the darker purple and gold are waiting list additions and removals respectively. And so you can see over the last decade, there actually has been a steady increase in the annual number of uh, transplants performed across the country. It's gone from about 2,500 to 
over the last two years, probably 36 to 3,800 a year, um, where we have reached sort of an equilibrium, it seems, with our additions and removals. Um, and perhaps there's been a slight decrease in uh, waiting list deaths over, over that decade. But nevertheless, you know, we still have over 3,500 patients currently listed for heart transplant in this country. And so despite a steady increase in annual uh, UNOS uh, heart transplant volume, uh, waiting list remains relatively constant at about 3,500 a year. And it's important to note also that there's likely many more patients that could be benefit from transplantation that are never brought forth for therapy. Um, either they're not referred or there's specific factors that uh, lead providers not to pursue that route. Um, so 3,500 doesn't estimate the total need, I don't think. Um, and there are many, many factors that influence, of course, when a donor may become available for any given recipient. So um, these might include recipient and donor specific factors, uh, such as size, sex, blood type, uh, center and regional factors, such as center specific practices and organ procurement organization practices. Uh, there's an element of chance, of course, uh, waiting for the right donor to come along. And then donor allocation policy uh, has a huge impact and um, it's had such an impact in our field. I think it's helpful to sort of review uh, some of the features of that uh, for those that aren't familiar. So um, if you look back on the history of uh, solid organ transplantation, and, and of course, specifically here, heart transplantation, this really became a viable therapy starting in the 1980s um, uh, when cyclosporin and, and uh, effective immunosuppression uh, allowed this therapy to be effective. And um, it was in uh, the mid 1980s when the, the US government um, uh, formed the uh, Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network, which then coupled with the nonprofit organization uh, UNOS or the United Network of Organ Sharing uh, to, to develop allocation systems for um, uh, solid organ transplantation. And so the first allocation system for heart transplantation went into effect in 1988. Uh, it was a two tiered system. It was pretty simple. It was those patients that were in the hospital on inotropes or perhaps a balloon pump uh, were status one, and everybody else was status two. Um, there was only slight modifications to this system over the next roughly 20 years, or over, sorry, over the rough, next roughly 30 years. Um, it was uh, eventually moved to a three-tiered system, and uh, there was a gradual broadening of sort of geographic sharing, although it still remained quite limited, uh, where there was great priority given to um, uh, centers within uh, UNOS regions uh, for heart placement. Um, <laughs> But it, it was becoming clear, particularly as we moved into the last decade, that, that the allocation system was deficient um, in serious ways for a number of reasons. Um, uh, among them was that there was felt to be insufficient differentiation of status priority uh, with respect to risk of death on waiting list. And there was actually some important publications that came from this institution, um, Todd Dardis and Wayne Levy, that helped elucidate that. Um, there was felt to be inequity in access to donor hearts based on geography. Um, and then there was felt to be unacceptable waiting list times and mortality. Um, and so highlighted in the red box here, you can see uh, some of the waiting list times experienced for patients at different status levels and even the highest status patients um, in the early part of last decade uh, would be waiting you know, close to three months from the time of listing. Um, and it, it was felt this was unacceptable and, and also driving um, uh, significant waiting list mortality. And so there's a lot on this slide, but I'm going to try to break it down simply to highlight the differences between um, uh, the old and new system. So in the old system, uh, status 1A, uh, where the highest status patients really comprised a very heterogeneous group of patients, um, those that were uh, admitted to the hospital on ECMO, um, uh, those that had LVAD with complications, not necessarily serious complications, even just a driveline infection would get status 1A uh, uh, listing priority. Um, those that were on single or multiple inotropes with hemodynamic monitoring, and then there's something called discretionary LVAD time where a uh, stable LVAD patient more or less elects to be high status for a period of 30 days. Um, and then status 1B were stable LVAD patients uh, or patients on continuous inotrope infusions, not with hemodynamic monitoring. So after this allocation change in October of 2018, the really major shift was um, uh, dividing up of the, the status 1A 
group into uh, three separate groups where now status one were patients on ECMO or those with mechanical circulatory support and life-threatening ventricular arrhythmia. Um, status two were patients um, that uh, broadly or, or crudely you could say were on some sort of non-dischargeable mechanical circulatory support. Um, including balloon pump. So um, uh, even just a balloon pump placement would get you that status two priority. Um, the status three included uh, patients um, that uh, had an LVAD with some sort of complication and then um, multiple inotropes or single high, high dose inotrope with um, uh, hemodynamic monitoring. And finally, then status four sort of reflected more the, the prior status one B patients, stable LVAD patients, inotropes without hemodynamic monitoring, and then um, uh, sort of restrictive cardiomyopathies or atypical cardiomy cardiomyopathies uh, were also included in this group. But beyond uh, severity of illness, uh, revision and in, in sort of status priority with respect to severity of illness, there was also significant revision to the allocation process relative to geography. And so this, this gets a little nuanced, but I think in a simplistic form, the way it can be described is that previously, centers within a given UNOS you know, region had significant prioritization for organs that were available within their own region. Whereas after the allocation change, um, there was still some priority given to distance relative to the donor center, but um, there was no longer priority given based on arbitrary, arbitrary geographic lines. Um, and the thought was that this was gonna allow for greater access uh, to potential donors um, uh, for recipients across UNOS you know, regions. And so again, this policy went into effect um, in October of 2018. And um, obviously there was a lot of speculation and um, excitement in terms of how that would um, impact our field and our practice. And um, it's actually just very recently that that's sort of starting to come to light as you know, data becomes available with a reasonable period of follow-up. Um, are we beginning to see exactly how um, the field is changing? Um, so, uh, this, this highlights a significant one way that our field is changing, I think, pretty significantly. So um, this is a study, it's a multi-center study that um, uh, looked at UNOS data uh, for about a year before and a year after the allocation change and uh, specifically um, described uh, what the nature of hemodynamic support prior to heart transplantation was. And so you can see in, in the post-change period, uh, there was a, a rather significant increase in the number of uh, patients that were supported uh, pre-transplant with balloon pump. Um, less significant uh, absolute change, but still significant um, change with regard to those supported with other forms of temporary mechanical cir circulatory support or ECMO. Um, and that came with a corresponding decrease in patients that were supported pre-transplant with uh, durable VAD or durable mechanical circulatory support. And so again, this is nationwide data um, uh, from UNOS. But in addition to these significant changes um, in terms of the way patients were supported pre-transplant, uh, these authors also described that there was uh, increase in the variation in practice. So pre-allocation change uh, in this box plot, um, you can see these were by there's center level evaluation, basically looking at the number of patients that were supported with me temporary mechanical cir circulatory support before transplant. Pre-change, the 25th percentile center was about 0% and the 75th percentile center was about 10%. Whereas post-change, the 25th percentile center was about 20% um, and the uh, 75th percentile center was about 50%. Uh, with pre-transplant temporary circulatory support. Uh, not only that, there's just greater spread and variation uh, between the 25th and 75th percentile centers. So uh, there seems to be greater variation in practice uh, within this overall change. And uh, further getting on this point, this was an interest, interesting study, um, really more of a critical care study, but was published in JAMA Cardiology in um, 2020 basically comparing the use of temporary mechanical circulatory support in cardiology ICUs, um, in transplant and then non-transplant centers. And one of the things that was uncovered here is that post-allocation change, uh, transplant centers uh, noticed a significant increase in temporary mechanical circulatory support, whereas non-transplant centers um, 
and the rates of temporary mechanical circulatory support uh, remained uh, stable. So this suggests that you know the field of transplantation really drives uh, this change in practice, and it, it corresponded to uh, the change in the uh, allocation policy. And so how does this affect um, sort of the other arm of advanced surgical heart failure therapies, uh, durable circulatory support? Um, so what happened with LVAD implants? So I think this is an evolving story. Um, this was published in 2021. It's Intermax data that describes um, the volume of LVAD implants across our country. In 2019, or the year after the allocation change, uh, VADs actually did not fall. It was actually the most VADs that have ever been implanted in this, in this country, over nearly 3,200. Um, but one thing that did change was the indication or the pathway for LVAD implant. So in 2019, 73% um, of LVADs that were implanted were destination therapy LVADs, whereas years preceding, um, that tended to be more in the, in the lines of 40 to 50%. So while the overall volume didn't change, um, certainly it seemed a smaller proportion uh, were being implanted with goals of either bridging to candidacy or bridging to transplant. Um, and I think it's going to be really interesting uh, when the next installment of Intermax data comes out, which should be within a few months, because I would suspect actually there's going to be a decrease in the total number of LVADs that were implanted nationally, um, not just a change with respect to um, destination versus bridging uh, therapy. Um, <laughs> you know, there was a lot of speculation on how this would, how this allocation change might affect um, post-transplant outcomes. Uh, so certainly one of the goals of the allocation policy was to decrease uh, waiting list mortality, allow uh, an opportunity to more readily transplant uh, the sickest uh, patients. Um, but you know, one potential drawback to that would be that if we're transplanting sicker patients, perhaps our uh, post-transplant outcomes will be impacted in a negative way. And so uh, this paper was published in 2020 um, in the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation, um, which basically came out, uh, you know, more or less with a six-month uh, interval from the time of, uh, of allocation change. So it was published right after they accrued uh, six months of, of time under the new policy. And, and uh, this paper caused quite a stir because, you know, the conclusion was that uh, the survival in the new allocation system, the six-month survival post-transplant is 75%, which um, is very poor. Uh, and, you know, traditionally that, that rate has been closer to around 90%. Uh, but you can see here the, the numbers for follow-up here are quite small. Um, the number at risk, even a three-month follow-up is only 125 in this cohort. So, uh, whether this was an appropriate um, number for a robust statistical comparison, I, I think it probably wasn't. Uh, but nevertheless, this paper caused quite a stir. Subsequent studies um, haven't borne this finding out. Um, so uh, now, you know, this is a paper that was published from a group in Ohio State just last month um, that had uh, significantly, you know, with greater time uh, accruing, there was significant, uh, uh, significant higher number of patients to be considered. And you know the survival curves didn't separate in a significant way. There, there may be a slight separation here, but it's not statistically significant. Um, and this is in line with other subsequent analyses that have occurred that, that there's not a clear difference in post-transplant survival, um, at least to short time periods, uh, six months to a year uh, under the new allocation policy. And I think it's worth noting that the median wait list time uh, fell from 93 days uh, to 41 days post-allocation change. Uh, that was statistically significant. So patients that get listed are on average getting transplanted faster. Um, and the total weight this death um, has fallen from about 350 a year in the years uh, preceding the allocation change um, to about 230 a year post allocation change. And I don't, I'm not certain whether that's statistically significant, but, um, but that's what it is. And I, I think it's fair to say that there probably is a difference there. Um, so what else has changed? So one important thing to highlight is that, you know, the distances people are traveling to go get their organs ha have clearly changed. And that, that comes with a corresponding increase in the uh, length of ischemia time, um, uh, you know, moving from three to three and a half hours on average um, in the pre and post allocation change periods. And, you know, uh, actually when I first arrived here, I was sort of uh, 
um, uh, taken aback <laughs> at how far uh, we would travel for organs and the ischemia times that, that our program was used to tolerating. But I think actually probably the prior success of our program um, probably has given others confidence uh, that uh, they can travel further and um, uh, still get good outcomes. Um, but as there's greater sort of uh, sharing across geography of organs, there's also a thought that this may, you know, have an impact in terms of, uh, it may manifest in a different form of geographic inequity. And, um, you know, there may be organs leaving uh, some places in favor of others. And there's a multitude of factors that come into that. But um, out of this paper from Ohio State, it was interesting. They sort of uh, at least describe grossly what's happening uh, at a state level in terms of uh, the net gain or loss of organs um, transplanted pre and post change. So if you're red, that means you have more organs. Um, it means you're transplanting less after the allocation change. And if you're blue, you're transplanting more. So it was interesting that Washington is, is appearing red that we may have a net loss in the number of uh, transplants being performed. Um, clearly, there's a multitude of factors that play into that, and we'll talk more about that in upcoming uh, slides. But, um, you know, it, 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 it does become apparent that there's new, there's sort of now new pressures from a geographic uh, standpoint in terms of where organs are ultimately getting implanted. And, um, and we've seen that even within our own, own OPO. Um, uh, this is data from Life Center Northwest that just demonstrates um, of the hearts that are of the hearts that are procured within our region. You know which ones stay within our region versus which ones leave. And you can see uh, in the last two years we're basically 50-50, uh, where 50 percent of our organs stay within our region and 50 percent leave. Uh, in the old allocation system, that was around 20%. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty significant change. So how about us here at the University of Washington? Uh, where do we fall in the greater context of this landscape? Um, so here's kind of a, a description of our index advanced heart failure case volume over the last nine years. So the, the dark line represents total number of cases and then the purple represents durable LVAD or, and durable LVAD and total artificial heart. Uh, and the gold represents heart transplant volume per year. And so um, you can see in the, you know, the early mid part of last decade, um, you know, we were really leaders in terms of volume um, for durable support devices. And that peaked out in 2015 and then gradually started to decline with a coinciding increase in uh, transplant volume uh, that peaked out uh, in 2018. Of course, um, subsequent to this time, there's been a number of significant changes. There was a change in allocation policy. Um, I think it's also important to note that there was, uh, you know, a pretty significant transition in um, uh, the surgical um, advanced heart failure uh, team over this time period. So there's, there's, you know, that's just one example of many factors that that impact this. Um, uh, but we had continued to see a decrease in, in LVADs as well as um, uh, some decrease in our total transplant volume, um, but uh, uh, last year we actually moved back in a positive direction, um, uh, implanting more LVADs and doing you know, about the same number of transplants as the year before. Um, and so that's where our program is currently. Um, in terms of how our practice has changed uh, with respect to um, uh, relative to uh, uh, the allocation change, um, you know, if you just look at the last year pre-allocation change compared to this past year, um, you can see in many ways our experience uh, is reflective of what's going on um, throughout the country. So uh, last year, 20% of our transplants were bridged uh, with pre-transplant balloon pump support. Uh, there was an uptick in ECMO as well as other temporary circulatory support. Uh, these were quite different from the pre-allocation period. And then you see there was a really significant change and you know, decrease in terms of the number of patients uh, bridged with um, durable mechanical circulatory support uh, devices. Uh, so again, very reflective of what's going on around the country. Um, these are our LVAD implants over the, that nine year time frame. Uh, the purple is bridge to transplant, the gold is uh, destination therapy. And so, um, you know, we're, we're seeing, I think, proportionally, probably less bridge to transplant. Overall, there's, there's been a decrease um, in uh, 
LVAD implant from the program's height, but um, you know, I think think that may be rebounding somewhat. Um, but it's you know, it's it's clear that our experience is probably reflective of what's going on around the country too, where there's less bridge to transplant LVADs going in. Um, and then, you know, just to review, I, I think relative to our um, recent short-term outcomes, uh, you know, data is still accruing, but, you know, obviously there's great interest in terms of how um, sort of the changed uh, pre-recipient transplant support processes are, are potentially impacting outcomes. Um, we need more time to accrue to really understand what the the year-long survival or longer-term survival is, but you know, thankfully last year I, we did pretty well in the short term. Um, transplant 30-day survival was 98.2 percent, and then LVAD and uh, TH 30-day survival was 96.7 uh, percent. So just to summarize some of these points, uh, the pathway toward heart transplantation, both at UWMC and across the country, has become more varied, uh, with a clear shift towards temporary circulatory support for, for, for pre-transplant recipient management. Uh, this hasn't led to clear changes in short-term post-transplant survival. Um, and I haven't touched upon this too much, but clearly there's going to be ramifications for advanced heart failure programs and health systems uh, with regard to resource utilization pre and post-transplant um, as, as the support strategies for these patients uh, shift towards um, temporary mechanical circulatory support. I think it's also likely the pressure to push recipient status priority and expand the donor pool is likely to continue to grow. So I'd like to spend some time talking about, you know, um, our temporary circulatory support program and the expansion of that and how that um, exists within the context of our system. So uh, this is just a schematic of, of you know, uh, where, this temp where temporary mechanical circulatory support um, plays a role in our system. We have patients in cardiogenic shock or progressive advanced heart failure. Um, uh, they have circulatory failure, refractory to medical or inotropic support. That's really when temporary mechanical circulatory support comes into play. Um, oftentimes patients are put on this sort of support without a clear uh, understanding of exactly what their mode of survival might be. Um, but there's a number of, of uh, pathways to survival, um, native recovery, heart transplantation, and durable circulatory support, and, and they all, all can come into play um, uh, with specific patients. So VA ECMO, um, I know a number of people on the call are familiar with this and have participated in the care of, of these patients. Um, but just to describe a little bit of what this is, um, it's a closed circuit with a pump, pump and an oxygenator connecting the venous and arterial system. Um, so there's a multitude of ways to do this, but our most common way is actually um, in the non, particularly in the non uh, post cardiotomy situation is that we access the femoral vessels and we place a large cannula in the femoral vein up towards the heart. Uh, blood is then drained um, uh, and moved through the pump uh, and the oxygenator back to the arterial side of the circulation where uh, cannula returns blood um, uh, to the arterial circulation. Um, and this provides full, it can provide up to full circulatory support as well as gas exchange. Um, we will often couple uh, ECMO therapy with um, an Impella CP. I'll talk more about that, but uh, to decompress the left ventricle that allows the, the ventricle to rest and also prevents stagnation of blood in the, in the, in the left ventricle uh, to prevent thrombosis um, of the left, left ventricle and aortic root. Um, and it's important to note that this really was not a viable uh, therapy, even you know, 15 years ago, uh, it's really over the last decade um, that the technology, the pumps are smaller, more trans transportable, the oxygenator and uh, circuit tubing, um, the biocompatibility of that has increased uh, dramatically uh, such that this has really become a, a viable means of supporting patients for even up to a couple of weeks. Um, and so, you know, as that has occurred, you know, the program here at UW has also grown. Um, so there's a fair bit going on in this slide, but this sort of describes what our case volume uh, with VA ECMO has been on an annual basis. So the black line is the total number of VA ECMO runs per year. Uh, and then the, um, uh, the gold and purple represent outcome measures. The gold is percent decannulated um, on any given year. And then uh, the purple is percent who survived to discharge. And you can see in the earlier part of last decade, um, we were doing about maybe 10 to 15 uh, VA ECMO runs a year, and that started to grow uh, pretty significantly from 2016 to 2018 before 
leveling off in the past couple of years um, uh, at between 40 and 45 runs a year. And so if we focus in on this past year, um, there's 42 runs and we had a, a, a percent survival to discharge at 57%, um, and percent decannulated was around 75%. Um, obviously patients who undergo this therapy are um, in advanced shock. Um, and so the survival is uh, never expected to be uh, especially good, but if you look at national registry data um, from ELSO or the Extra Corporal Life Support Organization, uh, survival for all comers who get put on VA ECMO is about 40 to 45%. And so it's not risk adjusted, obviously, but I think sitting at 57% is, um, is not, uh, it's not bad. Um, so this just sort of describes further the sort of patients we have uh, going on ECMO in our institution. So again, 42 total runs last year. Uh, some of these were seven of these were postcardiotomy heart transplant patients, um, and um, you know that number se may seem fairly high, but that's about actually what you'd expect. That's a, uh, a early severe graft dysfunction of about requiring mechanical circulatory support of about twelve percent, uh, ten to fifteen percent is sort of widely reported. So we'd love it to be lower, but um, that's sort of within the range that might be expected. Um, Eight uh, were eight patients who on, went on ECMO were post-cardiotomy non-transplants, so non-transplant cases that couldn't get off bypass. Uh, four patients were actually transferred from outside centers, uh, placed on ECMO at outside centers, and were transferred into our center for further management. Um, and then 23 patients uh, were cannulated through what I call our shock team. And I know probably a number of people on the on the call have participated um, in those calls, but this, for those who haven't, um, I think it's a very effective uh, process um, where patient uh, is identified in, in shock and thought to maybe need escalation support. Um, the page goes out and it's a multidisciplinary conference call uh, between um, cardiac surgery, advanced heart failure cardiology, interventional cardiology, uh, the CTICU, um, and then uh, perfusion and uh, ECMO coordinators, um, where we sort of on limited information, make a pretty rapid uh, decision on uh, what might maybe best for the patient in terms of escalating support. And so here are outcomes broken down by indication. I think it's worth noting that uh, these patients that come in through the shock team, I, I think really have pretty, you know, commendable outcomes. Um, you know, uh, patients who really are on death's door, um, you know, a survival rate of 65% um, really, I think is, is pretty good. Um, and through our other indications, um, you know, post-cardiotomy non-transplant and can't, patients cannulated from the outside, we don't do as well. But um, in terms of what happens to our shock team patients, um, uh, three had withdrawal support on ECMO, uh, five died after decannulation. So patients who we were able to get off ECMO, but ultimately, you know, usually lacked a, uh, a transplant or durable circulatory support option and weren't able to overcome their illness uh, to get over the hospital, get out of the hospital. Um, but eight patients that were success successfully bridged to native recovery. Uh, so sometimes this is just a period of support to allow whatever the insult uh, was uh, to recover, but oftentimes there's also an intervention. Um, I'm very appreciative of our interventional colleagues who, um, We'll take on you know very high risk PCI or mitra clips um, in certain circumstances to help ultimately allow a patient to liberate from ECMO. And we've had some good good success stories there. Uh, five patients uh, bridged um, to transplant from ECMO. Uh, four were directly from ECMO, and then one was stepped down to a balloon pump uh, before ECMO. And then two patients uh, bridged to uh, durable mechanical circulatory support. It's worth taking a moment to just discuss uh, the Impella devices. Uh, those who have been on the inpatient service um, are familiar with these, but uh, these are catheter-based microaxial pumps that pump blood from the LV into the aorta. Uh, so here's a depiction actually of an Impella 5.5, but uh, catheter-based uh, catheter -based pumps where there's an inflow that sits within the LV and then the pump basically sucks blood from the LV into the aorta. Um, uh, these come in a variety of forms. Uh, the Impella CP are uh, percutaneously placed. Um, our colleagues in interventional co uh, cardiology seem to be able to get these in within five to 10 minutes um, pretty remarkably. Um, and they use them for their high risk PCI um, as well as parcel LV support. You can get two to two and a half liters per minute flow uh, with these devices. And then we also uh, commonly use them to vent the LV um, for our ECMO patients. 
Uh, there's also more powerful Impella devices. There was the 5.0, uh, which um, is being superseded by the 5.5, but uh, these basically can provide full LV support. Um, they do uh, usually require a cut down on the axillary artery um, uh, to place through a side graft. Um, but uh, some of the issues that hamper the impellas are hemolysis and position difficulties. Um, uh, the 5.5 seems to be a little bit more amenable with that. Uh, it doesn't possess this pigtail and it's a little easier to place and seems to hold its position better. Um, so we've got a lot of excitement over this device that has just uh, come into the fold over the last year. Um, so here's some of our impella volume over the last five years. Um, so um, a lot of impella CP utilization that, that maybe is declining somewhat, but still settling out uh, between 60 and 70 impella CPs a year. Um, and while there are drawbacks to these devices, they still play an important role. Um, we were doing about 20 impella 5.0s a year. Um, uh, that tapered off a bit last year. Um, both Dr. Corsandi and I didn't come from a center where there's a lot of impella utilization, so that may have something to do with that. But we did implant our first impella 5.5s, and uh, we had a couple great success stories with that. Um, and uh, this device seems to overcome a lot of the limitations that the 5.0 had. So um, we expect that that's going to continue to be um, a growing part of our uh, practice. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning the Protect Duo, uh, which is a dual lumen cannula uh, that can be placed percutaneously that's used for RV support. Uh, so there's uh, one lumen sits in the, um, uh, in the right atrium, uh, blood is then um, drained um, through the pump and then moved back into the other lumen which sits, sits in the PA. And um, uh, this cannula has really changed what we can do in terms of RV support uh, on a percutaneous basis. Um, it's, it, it helps a great deal. Patients who have isolated RV failure, uh, but more commonly patients after LVAD who have acute RV dysfunction, um, we can bridge them to recovery. Um, so what lies ahead? I mean, I think, um, I think there's going to be, uh, I, think, I don't think the temporary support um, profile is going to go away. I mean, I think unless there is a radical change in allocation policy, I think that's only gonna increase. There is, um, uh, growing competition among centers, um, and that has led to, you know, uh, you know, I don't know what the right word is, but perhaps pushing status priority in order to help get trans patients transplanted. And so I think it's actually pretty remarkable to look at how things have changed even just over a couple of years. Um, and the purple is the percent of transplants at at various status, or so percent of transplants uh, at various status priorities, and the purple is the years 2019 and 2020, and the gold is the year 2021. And this is our center's data. And so, you know, if you look at that, uh, about 60% or, or thereabouts of our, our patients transplanted in 21 were status one through three, uh, whereas even just two years prior, um, it was only 40%. And uh, it's important to note also that we did about the same number of transplants in 2021 as we did in 2020, even with a relatively higher proportion of higher status patients. And I think that reflects uh, competition for organs. Um, but something else to note is that uh, 10 or nearly 20% of patients who underwent uh, heart transplant at UWMC last year were de novo heart failure uh, presentations uh, that were taken to heart transplant on their index presentation. So. These were patients that did not have prior contact uh, with our heart failure program that came in um, in advanced uh, circulatory failure, and then we were ultimately able to, to bring them directly to transplant. And so while there's potentially some drawbacks to this sort of system, I think it's important to note also that there is certainly a, a segment of patients that previously probably would not have had a chance at all for survival that, that, that are viable under this system. And um, it just highlights um, what I was trying to mention earlier that the de novo presentation of advanced heart failure or cardiogenic shock, um, that that sort of patient um, increasingly, uh, we can move towards advanced therapies. Um, another way to sort of address the in increased competition for organs um, is to find a way to, to use more organs. Uh, so to expand the donor pool. And so I think our center is actually uh, one of the centers that sort of drove uh, increased utilization of high risk uh, or, or sort of non pristine donors um, got effective results um, that was done, you know, uh, through the course of last decade. Um, and other centers have started doing that too. And um, so there's, there seems to be ever 
ever-growing competition. But if we can sort of open the portal to a new class of donors, it could make a big difference. And so um, shown here is the transmitic organ care system, um, uh, which is a portable organ perfusion circuit. Uh, it's got a pump oxygenator, oxygen gas cylinder, and then solutions for delivery of uh, buffered and nutrient maintenance solution. Um, there's also access ports for blood draws and medication delivery, delivery and then there's monitoring system. And so um, there's been two trials conducted with this device. Uh, the first was with uh, brain dead donors um, <clears throat> looking at marginal hearts or sort of extended criteria hearts um, that would be procured and then placed on this circuit and supported on this circuit and monitored on the circuit um, before implantation. And, um, you know, they basically showed in this trial that, you know, they had sort of expected one month and uh, six month survival rates um, and expected uh, severe primary graft dysfunction rates. So uh, Transmedics actually just um, secured FDA approval of this device for brain dead donors. And so this, this may help us in that population um, in terms of going even further or perhaps uh, looking at uh, extended criteria uh, hearts that we might not otherwise use. But I think much more interestingly, there's this concept of DCD heart procurement or uh, donation after circulatory death. Uh, so these are patients that don't actually meet criteria for brain death, but do have a devastating neurologic injury that they're felt not to recover from. Uh, but we can't uh, procure organs from them in, in traditional means because they're not legally dead. Um, so support has to be withdrawn um, and they have to actually experience cardiac and circulatory arrest um, <clears throat> before uh, organs are procured. Um, so the patient must expire. Um, and then usually there's at least a five minute grace period to make sure any signs of life are not regained. So other solid organs, uh, lung, kidney, liver, um, have all um, over the last two decades started doing DCD um, uh, procurement uh, for selected patients. Um, that, that was not the case for heart, uh, for heart donation. Uh, the heart, you know, the problem is that donation after circulatory death mandates pretty significant period of warm ischemia. And the heart, of course, is um, more sensitive than these other organs to warm ischemia. So there was a reluctance to um, consider transplanting those hearts. And that's actually started to change over the last two years. And while I was at Duke, I had uh, the opportunity to participate in some of the earliest uh, DCD heart transplantations that were performed in this country. Uh, there were some small numbers performed in Australia and the UK uh, before um, the first DCD heart was done at Duke um, in December of 2019. And, uh, you know, I probably participated in about 12 of these implants and um, the hearts actually seem to do very well. And um, I think it's an exciting horizon for, for organ access uh, for our patients. Um, uh, the results from this DCD clinical trial um, haven't been formally published, but there's been press release from Transmedics um, that uh, the results are good, basically uh, within the expected range of early survival. And so they're gonna be going for FDA approval for this indication as well. And that's something that we're gonna be hoping to get up and running on here at UW. Anyway, here's just a, here's just a, a quick video of what the heart looks like on the rig. Um, we have it perfusing through the aorta and um, uh, draining through the PA there. And uh, we reanimate the heart, it's perfused at normothermia. And uh, you can actually see how the heart's moving um, and then also follow labs, um, you know, in particular lactates uh, to see how the metabolism of the heart is going. Uh, so we, we hope to bring this technology back, in, back into fold here at UW um, in the effort to expand our donor pool. Um, so uh, just to summarize, um, in terms of what lies ahead, I think there's gonna be continued proliferation of temporary circulatory support as a mode of pre-recipient transplant management strategy. Um, I didn't talk about it a whole lot, but I think it's going to be important not also not to abandon durable circulatory support, both as a um, destination therapy and a bridging strategy. I think we've actually been pretty balanced in, in how we approach that. And uh, there certainly are going to be certain patients that are going to be better served by moving to dur durable circulatory support uh, from stability standpoint. Um, and then lastly, we need to promote means to expand the donor pool um, in order to remain competitive. And so with that, I'll finish and uh, thank you very much for the time. Thanks, Jeff. That was, that was really comprehensive and um, a really good overview of where our mechanical support and transplant program is and where it's headed. Um, we've got a, a couple questions. Um, so the 
first thing I'll do is see if we can unmute some folks to get them to ask their questions live. Uh, Andrew Perry first. Julia, if you could unmute Andrew Perry. Andrew, if you could uh, ask your question when that option pops up. We'll give this a couple seconds and then I'll just read his question if we can't figure this out. Oh, there we go. Oh, here we are, okay. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, my question, I was a little surprised by the data that you showed about our use of temporary mechanical support devices here and that those who are bridged to transplant, like 20% of them were bridged with balloon pumps, whereas like 3% of them were bridged with other forms, which I presume is the bulk of which is probably Impella. And I just, I find that difference quite striking. I was hoping you could elaborate on that difference. Um, well, I mean, uh, so, I mean, that, that's, that's what the numbers are. I think we use a fair number of Impellas at this institution, but if you actually think about the numbers that will we'll bridge, um, you know, Impella CP is, it hasn't really, we haven't really used that for sort of intermediate heart failure support. And um, as I noted, we weren't really using Impella 5.0s for that purpose either. We could see an uptick um, with that with Impella 5.5. That certainly gives greater support um, than a balloon pump. Um, but, um, you know, the nice thing about a balloon pump is if you get it in and, and it's providing adequate support for, for the patient and you're able to get them status two priority, I mean, the complication profile with balloon pumps is is very low. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, I think at least from my standpoint, um, if you can adequately support them with a the balloon pump and get them the status two priority to, to help promote get, getting the transplant for the patient, that you should do that first. Um, and I think increasingly, though, we'll see that there'll be perhaps even a step up strategy where balloon pump to Impella 5.5. So I would expect, I would expect the number of patients that are bridged through temporary mechanical support other than balloon pump, I would expect that number to actually grow. I mean, there's there's certain programs around the country that are jumping right to an Impella 5.5 um, uh, because the safety profile of that device seems to be uh, significantly superior than, than 5.0 um, and, uh, and, and you get status two listing without, without any difficulty. So next, we've got a question from April. We'll see if we can unmute Dr. Stempi and Otero and let her ask her question. I see a hand up from something that looks like Dan. Yes. Well, why don't we, while we're figuring out April, why don't you go ahead and ask your question, Dan, if you had one. Sure. Uh, Jeff, very nice talk, very comprehensive. Um, one question I have is I've been very impressed with our ability to support patients with STEMI related uh, cardiogenic shock. And while we hope for recovery in most of those patients, we don't always see it. Find patients who are adequately supported with temporary support and don't recover are a particularly difficult uh, patient population to make decisions about. And do you have any thoughts of how we can uh, bridge these people either to durable support or to transplant? Well, I mean, I think I think your point is 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 good. You know, and and one of the things I was <laughs> highlighting there is that oftentimes. It, you know, if you look at our UWMC shock program, you know, we place patients on ECMO or other forms of uh, circulatory support, and we obviously don't know the full story. And you don't really know what's what options may be available to the patient, um, what the likelihood of recovery is. So you definitely end up in um, sometimes in, in a state of limbo where, you know, the situation evolves on a day to day basis. And um, I think, you know, one, one tack that I think that we've taken, or, you know, I certainly have encouraged here is that um, when we encounter a patient like that, if we can rapidly, you know, initiate the advanced heart failure workup, um, 
so that you know potential options for transplant or moving to durable VAD can be on the table as soon as 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 possible. That makes a big difference, and I, I actually think our program has done a, a really good job of that. I mean, we've had patients that have gone on ECMO, and um, you know, within three days of meeting them, um, you know, have been listed for transplant. You know, that's that's sort of an exceptional situation, but I think it does show that the uh, I think it's a credit to uh, the advanced heart failure team that they can mobilize quickly and and get the things needed to be done for one. And a patient, a patient is appropriate for that to do that because you know if we we have those options on the table and can enact on them, that gives us a much better chance uh, for actually getting a survivor. Um, because what, what we want to avoid is the patient is sort of strung out on temporary support and and uh, they're just waiting to accrue complications. I mean, we want to move them to a more more stable situation um, when the opportunity becomes possible. Uh, April, go ahead. Hey, Jeff, that was a really nice talk. Um, I was curious, what percentage of our patients who are implanted as destination therapy cross over into BTT? Um, I know there's a certain percentage of patients we put therapies in so that we can um, get them in better shape for transplant, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I actually have this same question. So I'm, I apologize, I don't have the um, a precise answer for you, April. But I think um, if you just look back on the, you know, the history of our program, and, and there's actually a hole in, in Intermax data too. I mean, there's this sort of bridge to can't, I think there's really three groups. I mean, there's, there's patients that are clearly destination therapy, never going to be a transplant candidate. Um, and then there's patients that are literally listed for transplant that you're moving to a device just, just to help um, support and preserve them until they can get a transplant. And then there's a third group, which I refer to as bridge to candidacy, whereas we certainly hope they will become transplant candidates when you know some modifiable factor is modified while on support. Sometimes that's reducing pulmonary vascular resistance, or if you have a patient who has high BMI, you, you know, you hope we can get their weight down and um, you know, things like that, or substance contract. Um, so my, my suspicion is that that number is actually relatively high in our program, and I don't have the specific number, but I think it's worth looking into. I mean, I think particularly if you look back at the, you know, the years 2013, 2014, you know, you know 15, over 50% 50 of the transplants we did were off of LBAD. So, you know, you have to imagine that at any given year, most of, most of the, um, implant, bad implants that occurred were with the, the ultimate goal of transplanting the patient. So I'm going to read a, a question that got posted here. Um, and I think it's particularly relevant because, you know, what's interesting about you coming from North Carolina to Washington State is these are both states that have sort of these big academic medical referral centers and then a really large rural area. And there's been a lot of work on building networks. Of, you know, I mean, the STEMI networks in UNC are sort of like the, the gold standard. And so the question is, could you share your experience about management of transplant patients that are referred from rural areas of Washington? Are the systems in place ideal for communicating and coordinating with referring providers in rural areas pre and post transplant and, and probably for um, organ um, harvesting as well as part of that question? How's that going? Uh, it's a very good question. I think, um, you know, I, <laughs> one of the, one of the things that I'm going to be focused on um, moving forward is trying to, um, at least on the surgical th side of things, trying to, to establish relationships um, with referring providers around the state. <laughs> um, I'm fortunate that a lot of my practice and work, you know, comes directly from my colleagues in advanced heart failure cardiology who, who, have a good system in place. Um, I think there's always room for, you know, improvement in these areas. I mean, there's there's no doubt from an equity standpoint that uh, that you know we want to try to make therapy accessible to patients, not just those in Seattle, but those around the region, um, even those that don't have you know as many resources as as would be ideal to to bring them through these sort of complex therapies. So. I think their system is in place. I think there's there's constant room for improve, improvement, and and particularly on the surgical side of things, I think that's something that we do need to focus on because um, uh, there is um, perhaps some complacency in just 
appreciating that, you know, there's a good system on the advanced heart failure cardiology side, but, but we could actually partner with that and, and help it grow stronger. And um, of course, uh, hopefully we've got a solidified surgical group uh, between myself, Maz Korsandi, both of us who have been here a year and a half. And then Jay Powell just joined us as our, our, our surgical director for advanced heart failure. So that, that's something we're going to focus on. Great. We're, we're actually at time. Sorry, Jim and Melissa, you've got good questions. I'm sure Jeff can answer them offline for you, but thanks everyone for joining. Jeff, thanks so much for presenting today. Super interesting. Really appreciate your time and everyone else's and have a good Friday, everybody. All right. Thank you, everyone.